Hi, I'm Claire Napier, the cartoonist of The Magic Necklace, um, among others, a horror romance. You can find it on Zoop right now, zoop.gg forward slash c forward slash The Magic Necklace. You can find me at clairenapier.com or at Illus Claire on Twitter. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined by a very talented and creative person in the entertainment industry. So who is our guest today? She is a very talented artist, illustrator, creator of comics. Joining us from across the pond, we are joined by the <laughs> ever-talented Claire Napier from The Magic Necklace and many others. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well, thank you. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Oh, all right. I am a critic. I was at WAWAC for a very long time. I'm a busy editor and I'm a horror romance cartoonist. And my favorite color is pink. What we're talking about today is the magic necklace. But what mm -hmm. is that comic all about? Well, in the conceptual sense, it's about sex and desire as a matter of personal security, the meat of the thing. It's about Anne Rita, who is trying out a new way of being for certain reasons, and a horrible, horrible man who nevertheless is quite sexy. And they meet. When you're trying out new ways of being, there's plenty of risks that are available to take, and maybe since you're trying new things anyway, you want to take some of them. The comic is about that. What risks have you taken in terms of creating romance horror? Oh gosh. Well, I mean, just doing it at all is a big one. It's intimidating to make art. In the specific sense, it's extremely intimidating to draw people going at it, you know? Not everybody does that. I mean, not everybody does it in real life. Not everybody draws it on paper. And when you do, it's a lot to receive, as it were. And I have no idea what kinds of responses I'll be getting. Um, I've had good ones from the people who've read it so far, but the more general readership, I don't know. So that seems like a big risk to me. I'm glad to take it because I think it's a worthwhile story and I don't think it could be told any other way. So then what's the most misunderstood aspect about romance horror? Well, honestly, I don't know that it's a very widely discussed genre. It's not something that I saw and thought that suits me. It's a phrasing that came from my work, which isn't to say that I invented it or I own it or something. It's just that that's how it felt right to talk about the things that I do. And it's not necessarily something that people are already talking about, which is a shame. I think probably romance at large is misunderstood very widely, wouldn't you say? Yeah, we don't know what we want. <laughs> Right. Romance fiction has not necessarily received a great amount of serious respect, which is foolish. Also doesn't get respected in the, the frivolous ways that it should all the time, obviously. Some people are right, but not everyone. People get very silly, you know, like trying to prove things and act like you know, just nonsense. When you're talking genre, there's going to be people talking nonsense. Unfortunately, often, nonsense is spoken much more loudly than sense. I wouldn't bring preconceptions to the book, uh, genre preconceptions, but I also wouldn't bring expectation of subversion because it is certainly a romance story. If you read romance novels and you want the structure of a romance, you want the happy ever after, it has it. It is those things. It's just also in the horror vein and specifically in the romantic horror vein because the things people do to each other and the things that we want and the things that are available are intense, can be very threatening. But you get all that kind of stuff in romance already. It's just not necessarily labelled. When it is labelled, it's not necessarily labelled in a, an enticing way because I think that probably in the wider romance scene, like prose romance, I think that the magic necklace would be called dark romance, which is experiencing a big boom at the moment. And as far as I can tell, the way that it's spoken about, the expectation is quite gratuitous. And I feel like I would not have a good time with the majority of the material that is most widely talked about. But I do think that genre would still be where it should be placed because genre is not like a quality indicator and it's not an indicator of many specifics. It's just tonal, I think. It also depends on what you're into as well, too, when it comes to what you're reading. If you like 
horror or if you like romance sometimes it's either written very well or it's or it's not <laughs> that's true and sometimes i think genre is written too specifically yeah it's supposed to invoke the feeling of that genre which is not what i was doing i did not think i would like to write a romance or a horror or a horror romance that can fit that commercial categorization i wrote a story and it fits those genre categorizations but through happenstance through necessity of narrative you know what i found interesting when i was looking at the comic itself and of course looking at your campaign which we definitely have to talk about because your campaign is live how's that going so far it's going really well i wish it was over because <laughs> it's stressful to have this kind of thing a constant for a month it doesn't suit me very well but it is going well and i'm very grateful to all of the backers that we have so far and i'm excited for them to get the work i just <laughs> i i would like it to happen a different way <laughs> such is life so faster more money at the beginning so you can just stop and say i'm good right like get it over the line and then even though i would love to meet the stretch goals um at least i could relax to some degree it's the please like me stage that i find myself stuck in that i don't enjoy just try to get through it day by day and not feel like you're stalking people saying please give me the money <laughs> yes <laughs> Quite. From what I got to briefly read, which I, I loved, I enjoyed what I, I did get to read. So that was amazing in itself here. Excellent. The concept of the colors and the tonals that you were using in this entire thing was incredible because when you look at pink, white, and black as those specific colors, you don't feel like they should mix, but they do very <laughs> well in, in what you created. So I, I found that amazing in, it, in its Thank sense. You. And why the tonals and why the pinks? What was that artistic reference in regards to? Well... <laughs> I've gone into the tonal thing a little bit on a different podcast, apologies. I think I talked about that with Wayne from Wayne's Comic Podcast. Okay. So I will leave that to the side, but the other half of the question I have not discussed elsewhere, so this is exclusive for you. I have mentioned elsewhere that the first comics that I read were Bunty, um, a British girls weekly comics magazine. And I didn't only read the current material in my childhood, I've also then and since been a reader of the archive stuff because what? you know people and people have old collections in the attic and they hear that you like comics and they give them to you i have a wide range of bunty material from i think it first came out in 1958 it didn't come off the shelves until about the year 2000 and it was a weekly book so there's there's a lot of material there in the first few decades of its life it was mostly a black and white book as most british comics were for reasons of cheapness and not in a bad way just like that's the economics of the industry it did have often one color additionally which was usually red like an orangey red and there was this regular strip called the four marys which i have a great deal of fondness for um it's a boarding school comic and it's about these four best friends at the boarding school who all happen to be called mary they've all got a different surname but they sort of form a little mystery gang and have hijinks and adventures and, and that kind of thing. And it was drawn in black and white, but with spot reds, which is ideal for a boarding school story because everybody's wearing a uniform. So you can have a red jumper or a red check in the skirt or something, um, but you can also use it more widely. You can use it for the, an additional tonal value. Because I read those comics young, it seems normal to me. It's just a kind of comic book art that you can do and that has a certain familiar feeling and has a certain narrative value. The experience of reading black and white in colour is, is different, like we know that, and some comics do better in black and white, some better in colour, some artists look better black and white, some look better coloured. It depends how you apply your lines and what you're drawing for. Um, and at the time, I can only assume that they were drawing for this spot colour and it worked perfectly. The drawing is, like, technically realistic in that it doesn't have cartoonish proportions or anything. It's very down to earth. In the earlier 20th century, a looser line was much more common than it is now. And I miss that because a looser line has the effect of impressionism and i really love that kind of mental process of comprehension of something that's not completely specific when something is completely specific i can look at it and i can read it and i can read the words i can see what's happening but there's some additional process that isn't happening for me as a reader and i just find that i miss it 
because I enjoy that process and I appreciate it and it it adds something to the experience for me offering that same enhanced not really interactivity but kind of almost is something that seems natural and good to me I like it (laughs) so I did it but it also gives you a little freedom as well in terms of your artistic style and your creativity you're not locked into a a pose or a character Mm, or whatever else and I think the the expressionist period of art is some some of the most impressive art I'm mixing my genre uh, my uh, my art periods now my uh, art teachers would be would be horrified (laughs) and I think that the comic genre itself while it's a little more approachable these days you're not going to see in an art gallery unless it's uh, an Andy Warhol or something like that. The comic industry itself has so much to offer in the, in the different eras that have come about, yourself included as well, to independent creators as well. They should be showcased more, I think, and just to give yes. people a different variety. Small galleries, like boutique style galleries, do do exhibitions of current work, um, like Warwick Johnson Cadwell has an exhibition on right now nice. um, in Sheffield, I think. There was a a really great looking Katie Skelly exhibition a few years back. But as you say, these are small scale, like not to diminish them, but the museums and galleries that are inviting this kind of thing are not the ones that are defining the field of art, which is a shame. There's always like comic specific museums, like don't want to leave them out because God bless them. Of course. yeah. (laughs) What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Honestly, I can't remember a time before I knew this. I was a hyperlexic child. I don't remember. (laughs) Some of my earliest memories are of my uncle and aunt's wedding when I was two. And I remember having conversations there. There was this big staircase, right? It was in some kind of hotel. There was this big lobby and this sweeping staircase going up. Very romantic. But there was nobody on the level up the stairs. And because there were people on the lower level, I could see that that there was a difference and there was no gate, there was no rope, there was nothing to say don't go up these stairs, but I could tell that no one was going up the stairs. So I was like, what, how does this, what, what don't I understand here? And I asked my dad, what's happening up there? Um, And he said, well, why don't you go and see? Because my dad (laughs) loves to break a rule every now and then. (laughs) He loves to trespass. I I don't, (laughs) he dared me to go up the stairs and I did, I crept up. And there was no one there and I think it was probably like the rooms where my incoming aunt was Mm. putting a dress on and so on but nobody saw me or caught me or anything and I looked through the banisters and my dad was there grinning and waving and I ran back down because it felt I could feel that I I still wasn't supposed to be there (laughs) but he told me that I could go so I did go even though I could tell that I shouldn't go the power of of language and non-language both are very present in that set of memories that was when i was two my earliest memories so it's always been right there it's the excitement as well too the thrill of doing something different and and naughty so to speak (laughs) it's also a way for expression as well too and you could also showcase that in in the creative talent I, i believe as you have here so then what is your creative kryptonite I don't know, because I'm not sure what that means. Um, Do you mean kryptonite like it hurts me and I hate it? Or do you mean kryptonite like I'm weak for it and I love it? Like it it could be either of those. What what am I weak for? Like as a creative or? As a a creative. Oh. Because now now I might have to change this question because this is interesting. (laughs) Character, I think. I don't find it too hard to come up with a fun scenario. But if I can't build a really strong, independently effective character to inhabit it, then I don't continue. Like I might play with it for a while, but it doesn't, it doesn't become something. What was the first thing that you created that made you realize, yes, I could do this professional? The narrative structure and characters and ideas essentially for my comic Dash Dearborn and the Unexpected Earthman. One issue of which has been out in sort of zine form for a while. 
but I'm redrawing it currently because I can do it better. <laughs> <laughs> like it was the first, it wasn't the first comic that I made, but it was the first comic where I felt I knew what I was doing and that it could actually be a whole thing. Like I could see how it all worked. I could look at the whole conceptual mechanism and see it going and want to see it not only because I like wanted to be a creator, but also because I wanted to see that thing specifically and how it worked and put it all together. It felt, I don't know, particular. Not only creative, but also critical. It was explicitly working from influences and things that I have critical thoughts on and have published critical thoughts on. It was still a story that made sense in itself. And for me, those two levels of, of being, I need both or it doesn't count. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Jim Shooter. Mm, why? <laughs> I think that he is brilliant. I think he's a great writer. I think he's a great editor. He brought in great talent. He made decisive actions. His career dazzles me and I want, I mean, I can't, but I would love to better it. So how's that informed your own career? Well, it just sort of showed me that I could. When people act large, it creates space in their wake. I like extreme personalities because having things done, like the more that's actually been proven to be possible, the more there is below that. Even if you don't reach the moon, there's plenty more to land amongst, you know? From a professional standpoint, you have been a, a critic, you've also been a comic creator, and you have a currently an amazing campaign going on for, of course, your comic currently here today. Professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> I have a great life. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't make great money, but I take care of my mental health and my family connections and my friendships and my various community membership. I do make money from something I really enjoy doing. I have creative outlets. I dress the way that I like. I know what kind of things I don't like to wear. My house looks the way I want it to. It's got an interesting structure. I like my garden. <laughs> like there's nothing that I don't enjoy in my life really. How can you beat that, you know? The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Well, one can only go through them. I suppose there probably are ways to not deal with failure. Luckily, I don't know what they would be. It just happens. I guess one aims for grace. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as maybe possibly a critic or a comic writer or artist or creative person in some way, shape or form. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Well, just do your best all the time, all the time. Be willing to be new all the time. I suppose it's on my mind recently because I've been doing some creative exercises in this direction. I read the Narnia books a lot when I was young and have returned to them since. I was always very fond of Edmund, but he was eclipsed by Eustace because they get the best learning, which is unfair. Susan should have got hers, but she didn't, so we'd make do with what we have. There is a scene in which Eustace, who is a terrible, horrible, irritating, bad person, he's been annoying everyone, he's selfish, he, through his own misadventure, has been turned into a dragon, and he does not like it, he doesn't want to be a dragon, he wants to be a boy again. And the only way for that to happen is for Aslan to tear with his lion's claws the dragon flesh off of Eustace's boy soul and he just has to bear it and he does bear it and he's a boy again and now he has learnt humility and he knows how to be decent and he learns to be nice and useful and good and supportive and all kinds of other useful things and I think about that often but more often I hope to emulate it if you can't bear your dragon flesh being torn off you're a pussy I'm sorry try harder well that's definitely one answer i haven't heard yet so that's good. <laughs> good. I like, I like that. if your life was a comic book or a series of some kind what would its title be and what would its soundtrack be gosh i don't know i don't know what the title would be and that's annoying because usually i'm good at titles i have no idea but the soundtrack would be hair metal and experimental jazz because that's generally what i listen to 
currently. I'm going to think of a good title and I will, I will tell you, but in the moment it's escaping me. Shit. This is sabotage. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't warn me. I'd have thought of a great one if you'd warned me. No, I can't, I can't do it. I'll have to, I'll have to just bring one in to follow up. Damn. <laughs> next time you're on. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. You'll have to bring two next time you're on, just because. Okay. Homework. <laughs> Well, Claire, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you so much for having me. For those that want to support your Zoop campaign, of course, and yourself online as well, too, when is the Zoop campaign ending? And where can we find it? And where can we find you online? I think that it's ending on the 14th of March. March, yes. Um, because it started on the 14th of February. And it was supposed to be running for one month. So that's my best guess. ClaireNapier.com has everything. <laughs> at Illus Claire, I-L-L-U-S-C-L-A-I-R-E. On Twitter is, um, for now, a stalwart. And yes, please do, please do check out the Zoop campaign, which is at zoop.gg forward slash C forward slash The Magic Necklace which isn't too hard. You can probably remember that and type it in. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. But of course, I am only one person. So my YouTube channel is a lot more updated than our website. And it is youtube.com forward slash c forward slash TGT Media. The podcast is back after 12 or so years. So you can find that at twogeekstalking.com podbean.com but if you search for two geeks talking on any of your streaming services you'll find it there as well too and eventually you're going to see claire's interview on there as well probably the day Yay. after i post this so look for her there as well too and as i say every week everyone has a story to tell it's up to me to help bring that out thanks for listening and watching on two geeks talking